So I have a few things at the top, so I'm going to pour myself a cup of water, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, and then we'll get started. All right. So welcome, everyone. Um, I have a few things at the top, if you can bear with me. Um, Secretary Kerry is in New York today, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, with Secretary of Defense Ash Carter. And they're hosting the U.S.-Japan Security Consultative Committee, or what we refer to as the 2 plus 2. This morning, they met with Ch Japanese Foreign Minister Kishida and Japanese Defense Minister uh, Nakatani. This afternoon, Secretary Kerry will meet uh, with his foreign minister counterparts from Jordan, Egypt, and Iran. And he will also deliver remarks at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference at the United Nations. With regard to Nepal, I would like again to express our deepest condolences to all of those affected by the earthquake in Nepal, particularly the families of those who died or were injured. Our embassy in Kathmandu is working around the clock. On Saturday, Ambassador Bodhi declared an emergency, releasing $1 million to relief organizations working in Nepal to address immediate humanitarian needs. And today, you probably have heard Secretary Kerry announced an additional $9 million for response and recovery efforts. We are sending a nearly 130-person disaster assistance response team to conduct assessments, coordinate the humanitarian response, and provide search and rescue capabilities, along with 45 tons of cargo. Advanced elements of that team are already on the, on the ground, and the team consists of a 57-person urban search and rescue team from Fairfax, Virginia, that will arrive in a few hours. Another, a second 57-person um, urban search and rescue team from the Los Angeles County Fire Department that should arrive Tuesday, Washington time. And 14 disaster experts with USAID and six rescue dogs that are incorporated into both of these search and rescue teams. Among those killed, we are aware of uh, four U.S. citizens who died in the Everest region. We express our deepest sympathies to their families and loved ones. And the United States stands with the people in Nepal and the region affected by this tragedy. We are running around-the-clock operations with the government of Nepal and the international community to account for all U.S. citizens and assist with the disaster response effort. Third item, Ukraine. We are deeply concerned by the deteriorating situation in Shirokinya, where, which is near Mariupol, where the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission reported on April 26th that monitors observed the most intense shelling since fighting began in the area in mid-February, mid-February of this year, that is. Russia-backed separatists continue to shell Ukrainian forces and refuse the OSCE mission unfettered access. These are clear violations of the ceasefire and the Minsk agreements that they signed. And as the OSCE has made clear, access for the monitoring mission is not subject to negotiations. It is the mission's duty and their task. At the same time, Russian and separatist forces maintain a sizable number of artillery pieces and multiple rocket launchers within areas prohibited under the Minsk Accords. Also, the Russian military has deployed additional air defense systems into eastern Ukraine and moved several of these nearer the front lines. This is the highest amount of Russian air defense equipment in eastern Ukraine since August. Russia is also once again building up its forces along its border with Ukraine. The United States has been clear that the Minsk agreements remain the best chance for a lasting and comprehensive solution to the crisis in eastern Ukraine. And we call again on Russia and the separatists it backs to implement their commitments under the agreements. One uh, final media issue. Um, with World Press Freedom Day less than a week away, the department is launching its fourth annual Free the Press campaign. The campaign uh, beginning today and every day this week, we will highlight emblematic cases of imperiled reporters from around the world who are imprisoned, harassed, or otherwise targeted for doing their jobs by reporting the news. We will spotlight these cases in three ways over this week. We will raise them uh, here in the daily press briefing each day. Uh, we will be spotlighting them at humanrights.gov, which is uh, our uh, human rights uh, page on our website, and we'll be using the hashtag um, free the press to spread the word and message on Twitter. Um, with the first two cases we are highlighting this year, um, our first free the press profile comes from China, where veteran journalist Gao Yu was recently sentenced to a seven-year term after a closed trial for quote-unquote leaking state secrets overseas. 
Ms. Gao has been internationally recognized for her significant contributions to press freedom and civil society in China since her career began in 1979. She was arrested in April 2014 as authorities detained dozens of activists and dissidents ahead of the 25th anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Her conviction is part of a disturbing pattern of government action against those who peacefully question official Chinese policies and actions. We join the international community in calling on Chinese authorities to release Ms. Gao immediately. And our second case comes from Syria, where three important freedom of expression activists remain detained on government orders. Mr. Mazen Darwish, Ms. Hani al-Zitani, and Mr. Hussein Guerrer are imprisoned. They were arrested in 2012 for advocating for freedom of expression, and they were held for two years without charge and an additional year without trial after the charges were filed. Their trial has been postponed 21 times and is rescheduled for tomorrow, April 28th. We continue to call for the immediate release of all three individuals who were arrested and remain detained for exercising their human rights. We also call on the Assad regime to release all arbitrarily detained journalists and political prisoners who are currently suffering uh, <coughs> horrific um, uh, conditions and are at risk of abuse and torture in the prisons. Lastly, I would just like to welcome a group of four Honduran journalists who are in Washington to meet with press officers at various U.S. government agencies. Welcome to you. They'll be observing the press briefing today. And with that, over to you, Brad. Great. Um, first, Nepal. Um, can you give us, can you just tell us how difficult it is to get stuff in? Uh, any, any problems you're encumbering as you rush all this aid there? Uh, well, the, uh, I think the important thing is that the airport remains uh, open. Um, and so, of course, that is, uh, that is making, uh, making it easier for flights to get in. But, of course, uh, you know, communications and transportation throughout the country remain difficult um, because of the damage uh, that, has, that has been caused by the earthquake, of course. Um, I would also highlight uh, that the United States, even before the earthquake, we've been helping uh, authorities in Nepal prepare for uh, an earthquake, um, and so one of one element of that assistance um, is um, a donation of 1.8 million dollars that had took place previously through our um, Global Peacekeeping Operations Initiative, uh, and that includes disaster relief equipment which has been pre-positioned around Nepal. Um, it includes heavy engineering equipment, tractors, bulldozers, dump trucks. Um, and that will be used in the in the earthquake uh, relief efforts. Um, I, I've got some additional detail which I can get into about other assistance we've provided before the earthquake. Um, if you if you'd like to uh, get into that, we, we can, do we can that maybe do that. The questions. Um, go yeah, ahead. maybe do that offline. Um, I'm still on Nepal. Um, you said there was one million, and then a subsequent nine billion has since been announced. A million with an M. Million with yeah. an M. Uh, this does not represent the sum total of what you plan to spend, I guess, uh, as part of Nepal relief efforts. This correct? is our initial response. I, I wouldn't expect it to be the are, end. Are you talking with the UN and other donor countries about some sort of coordinated approach that meets what I imagine would be uh, uh, needs that are uh, ten or hundreds of times greater than than? Mm -hmm the amounts you've kind of specified? Well, we, we don't have an estimate of what those needs will be. Of course, we're going to coordinate with the government of Nepal, as well as with the United Nations and other members of the international community. There, uh, there was an initial meeting to that effect um, today in Kathmandu, which Ambassador Bodhi uh, attended. Uh, that, uh, that was a meeting with all diplomatic missions. Uh, our ambassador has been in touch with the prime minister and the chief of the army staff. So we're going to keep coordinating closely, but I don't have uh, announcements yet to make I'm sure once our team is on the ground and they're better able to assess the uh, the situation, then uh, that will uh, that will be um, there will be more forthcoming. Um, I would also highlight that our embassy um, our embassy remains uh, open, um, and uh, the the U.S. embassy and the American Club continue to shelter U.S. citizens and their family members, uh, as well as dozens of non-Americans. Uh, there are about 85 U.S. citizens at our chancery and about 220 U.S. citizens at the American Club. Um, we're also fielding uh, calls coming in from the public. Um, we've gotten calls from hundreds of U.S. citizens outside Nepal uh, who are trying to, uh, who are concerned about their relatives inside the country uh, and have asked for our uh, assistance. We are supplementing our embassy staff um, with, with our resources in the region. 
um, to better enable us to respond uh, to not only to the things concerning U.S. citizens, but also liaison coordination with the U.S. government and such. I have just one more on, on, on Nepal, and yeah. it pertains to the uh, four American citizens who uh, died. Um, have you been Have you been able to notify uh, family members? And if so, are you able to confirm their identities? Um, I, I have two names that I can confirm. Uh, we can confirm the death of U.S. citizen Vin B. Truong and Eli Taplin. And we are aware of reports of the deaths of two other <clears throat> American citizens. Uh, all of these uh, were located at the Mount Everest base camp area when the earthquake um, struck. Uh, once again, we express our deepest condolences to the family and friends uh, of the victims. Uh, but out of privacy considerations, we, we don't have further comment on the other two. Did you have more on in Nepal? About and the we'll victims, because I yeah. knew about three yesterday, and then you've mentioned a fourth one. Were they separate, or were they in different parties, or, or were they all together? As far I mean, were they mm -hmm. traveling together? Or? I don't know if they were part of the same group. That that I I would have to look into and see. Um, it may just be that we only got confirmation um, of the citizenship uh, and later. How many people have been reported? U.S. citizens have been reported missing. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, uh, we've been following up on the reports, um, but I don't have, uh, I, I don't have a, a, an estimate uh, to give you. Again, as I mentioned, we've gotten calls from hundreds of people uh, trying to verify the welfare and the whereabouts of their U.S. citizen relatives inside Nepal, um, but I don't, have a, uh, I don't have a firm tabulation of the number of American citizens who, who might be missing. Uh, I, I think sure. Justin had a question, and then yeah. we'll come to you, Raz, uh, yes. on the same topic. Go ahead. Uh, oh, thanks. Um, the C-17s that are flying in to um, provide relief, do you know if they're going to be planning to take Americans out from the airport at Cavendu? There are apparently a number of Americans trying to leave, as are a lot of people, I would imagine. So will the C-17s carry out Americans? Well, the airport remains open. Um, we understand that many U.S. citizens are departing on commercial flights. Uh, we are assisting American citizens uh, there with flight arrangements. We've also been providing uh, shuttle services to the airport, given the, the very difficult uh, conditions. Uh, I don't have anything to confirm about other sorts of transportation uh, arrangements. Uh, again, the, the airport remains open, and so uh, we're, we're focused on helping American citizens in that regard. Uh, I, I don't have further detail on that one. This may, um, yes, Ross. Yeah, this may be a bigger picture question, but it's it goes to whether or not Nepal can be effectively rebuilt. Um, the reason why there are so many Westerners in Nepal right now is because this is the spring climbing season. It's the best time of the year to try to summit Everest if you're a mountain climber. And Nepal is charging each of these people upwards of fifty to a hundred thousand dollars each for permission to try to summit the mountain. But when you look at the devastation across Kathmandu and across these villages, places that wouldn't pass any sort of Western building code, it makes people wonder, where is all that money going? And then when the U.S. government then says, we're now going to start spending at least $10 million to try to provide support to the people of Nepal who've been affected by this earthquake, the question is, how do you know that the money isn't going to be siphoned off by corrupt government officials and will actually go towards rebuilding the homes and the businesses of the Nepalese people, many of whom never see any of these sums of money that come in either through mountaineering or through foreign aid? Well, uh, Roz, Nepal has just experienced a devastating earthquake, and we are we are assisting uh, because that's part of our the way we respond to humanitarian disasters. Um, now, with respect to the uh, the particular the, the particulars of the ten million uh, that we've talked about, there was the initial one million dollars announced over the weekend. The nine million dollars that the secretary talked about today um, is is focused primarily on our disaster assistance response uh, team. So, in other words, it's supporting the U.S. personnel who are going into the region to help with search and rescue um, and to help with those immediate uh, recovery, uh, recovery efforts. Um, as I said in response to, uh, to Brad's question, we, I don't have any additional announcements to make, but I, I would also highlight that the kind of assistance the U.S. government has been providing, um, just uh, two examples perhaps that are pertinent in this case, um, oh, the United States military has been spending about $1.2 million 
to construct deep tube wells within the Kathmandu Valley that would be able to provide water supplies uh, in a major disaster. Two of those uh, deep tube wells were operational, um, and they are providing water supplies to Kathmandu residents. They were completed in recent months. Uh, also, the United States government uh, in, in recent uh, uh, time has funded the construction and equipment of a seismically safe blood bank. We spent about a million dollars uh, on that. Uh, that's at the Tribhuvan University Teaching Hospital. That blood bank is currently open and operational. Um, and that's in addition to, uh, to other work that the U.S. military has done on disaster preparedness training um, and upgrading infrastructure. Um, anything else on Nepal? Uh, okay, new topic? Sorry. Yeah, Leslie. Uh, Clinton emails. Um, CNN vaguely reported something that, the, that um, the Clinton emails were going to be released sometime this week. Can you got a, have you got a timeline for us for that? I, I don't have any uh, timeline or announcement to make about uh, the timing. Of course, as we've talked about, uh, there are two tranches. The first is the 300 emails comprising about 900 pages, which are focused, uh, that's which we um, provided to the select committee. We're going through those first. We'll release those first. We'll make them publicly available when they're ready, but I don't have a timing announcement on so that. So that report's not correct? Again, I don't have a timing announcement to, to, to make uh, at this at this stage. Um, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, regarding your comments on Ukraine, uh, you seem pretty adamant that Minsk two is being violated. Could you clarify? Were you saying that uh, specifically who this uh, building thinks is is violating? Are we talking the Russia-backed separatists or also the Ukrainian military? And a, a follow-up to that as well. <laughs> Well, again, it's, it's clear if, if we just look at the situation uh, near Shirokinya, uh, which is uh, near Mariupol, in other words, it is well uh, outside, uh, well beyond the ceasefire line. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Russia-backed separatists uh, continue to fire on Ukrainian government forces, um, and uh, that's a clear violation of the Minsk agreements. And I think we've spoken separately last week about uh, the ways in which um, Russian, Russian forces, uh, Russian personnel, uh, are, are working uh, together with the, the separatists um, uh, in, in eastern Ukraine. So I think that the situation there is pretty clear. Uh, murmurings from various voices uh, in the U.S. government and the administration about imposing or, or leveling uh, some new slate of uh, sanctions on uh, Russian individuals and, and possibly even businesses and government entities, if Minsk too was repeatedly violated, it sounds like you're saying it has been. I wonder if you can give us a, uh, an update or a sense of where we're at with that sanctions conversation. Is there movement uh, towards it, perhaps? Well, uh, the, the sanctions, of course, are connected to, uh, to the presence in eastern Ukraine of the separatists and, the Russian, uh, and, and their Russian backers. I don't have new sanctions announcements uh, to make, uh, but of course the sanctions are linked uh, to implementation of Minsk, uh, and there's no way the sanctions can be rolled back uh, unless Russia and the separatists live up to their Minsk commitments. And I'm not talking about rolling back. I'm right. talking about possibly adding more. I understand. I don't have any new sanctions announcements to make, though. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't have any uh, information to add to what uh, we shared uh, last week uh, on the air defense uh, systems. I'm but happy to go through that again, but I don't yeah, have any information Yeah, but you're saying that the number it. of them has increased. Is that correct? <coughs> right. Uh, we, uh, this is the highest um, uh, amount of Russian air defense equipment in eastern Ukraine since August. Since yes. Ukraine. Yeah. Um, last week, I think in the statement you referred in, in not you, but this department sure. referred to combined Russian separatist forces, I think three times in a single statement, which seemed to be uh, a closer linkage than, than maybe identified in the past. And in light of that, I'm wondering if this activity uh, near Mariupol is the result of Russian-backed separatists, as you just indicated, or this combined Russian separatist force that you outlined yes uh, last week. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let me separate those two a little bit. I, I, okay. I because it, it is uh, you, you're you're right uh, to recall that uh, we we see the the Russian uh, presence in eastern Ukraine um, has has be, been part of increasingly complex training of separatist forces. Um, this training also incorporates, for example, Russian UAVs. Um, which uh, is, is, is also a clear sign of Russia's, Russia's presence. 
and uh, and so we see uh, you know increasingly the the Russian and separatist forces oh sorry the Russian command and control presence uh, in, and equipment in eastern Ukraine uh, also uh, you know is why we've described it as uh, combined Russian and separatist uh, forces now with respect to the question of of the uh, current artillery activity around Shirokinya, uh, I don't have information to uh, to draw a conclusion about uh, whether that is separatist activity or Russian separatist combined forces. What we were describing in the in the information we put out last week was the uh, the overall uh, situation in eastern Ukraine. I can go back and look and see if we have more detail on Shirokinya. Uh, that that would be helpful. Okay, um, we'll do that. I would I would ask as well. I mean, do you hold Despite you're not at this point willing to call that a combined Russian separatist force or offensive, do you hold Russia ultimately responsible for this latest offensive? Well, again, we've said uh, for for a long time uh, that uh, Russian support to the separatists um, is essential to their uh, to the military activity they've been able to carry out. We've seen that throughout the conflict. Um, so. Uh, again, I, I don't have uh, data at my fingertips with regard to the makeup of the forces who are shelling Ukrainian positions uh, well outside the ceasefire lines. We'll look to see if we can get that. Um, but I think the overall, in the overall situation, it's quite clear that Russia's support is essential. Without, without getting into the uh, force makeup, do you see this latest attack as, as a product of the Russian command and control operations that you've identified in recent days. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand the question. I, I yeah. uh, will we'll look into that and, and come back to you. Um, same topic, Russia, Ukraine? No. Yeah. no? Um, okay, uh, well, Michel? Yeah. Uh, to Yemen says uh, that Yemen political deal was closed before Saudi airstrikes uh, began and uh, added the campaign derailed the agreement that could have averted conflict. Do you have any comment on that? Well, from the United States' view, it's quite clear that the the unilateral aggressive actions by the Houthis and their supporters uh, are the reason for the disruption in the political transition process. So, uh, you know, that's uh, that's clearly the pattern uh, that's been observed, and it was in response to that pattern of unilateral and aggressive actions that Saudi Arabia launched. Uh, its operation. Were you aware of this fact before uh, uh, the U.S. supported the, the uh, military operation led by Saudi Arabia? Well, we, we worked closely and we continue to work closely with the United Nations and with our international partners. Um, again, the, the ultimate goal here is a political dialogue that would lead to a peaceful political transition. Um, there is an established international framework, the Gulf, uh, the GCC initiative and the National Dialogue Council. Um, uh, so you know, we, we see quite, uh, quite clearly that it was the Houthi uh, aggression that, uh, that caused uh, this breakdown and led to the Saudi operation. But don't you th don't you think that uh, the military operation um, uh, broke the, the deal between the parties in Yemen? Well, the Houthis were not abiding by that deal. That's the, I think that's the essential point. It, that there there were there were extensive efforts made by the United Nations, uh, and those efforts were supported by the international community. And it was the Houthi reluct or, or sorry refusal to engage in that uh, dialogue process and their resort to violence. Uh, which has brought us to the situation that we find ourselves in now. Thank yes, you. Pam. Jeff, over the weekend, the State Department released its statement expressing disapproval for Burundi's decision to allow the president to seek a third term. Since then, has there been any dialogue between the U.S. and Burundi? Has the U.S. expressed those concerns directly to the government? And if so, um, what kind of response have you received? Well, you're, you're, uh, on April 25th, we stated that we continue to support the Burundian people's uh, peaceful pursuit of their democratic rights and freedoms. Um, we also see this as a missed uh, an opportunity, a significant uh, opportunity that has been missed. Um, we urge all parties to participate in the legislative and national elections. Uh, we, we remain in touch with the uh, government of Burundi uh, counterparts. Uh, I don't have any specific conversations from, uh, from the State Department to read out, though, in that regard. Can I ask you another? Yeah, thing? go ahead. Oh. Uh, is, is same topic, Pam? No. Oh, okay. Then yeah, we'll follow up here, Leslie. But do you believe that the president should not be standing for that third term? Well, uh, again, we we see we as we said in our statement, we we see this um, you know as disregarding the term limit provisions of the Arusha Agreement, um, and uh, we think that Burundi has has missed a, an historic opportunity to strengthen its democracy and establish a tradition of peaceful uh, democratic transition. 
um, uh, so certainly we uh, uh, that that's our view on the on the decision itself um, for him to stand. Um, yeah, uh, no. Yes, no. Sorry, sorry, Egypt. Uh, Egypt. Yeah, on on your press freedom campaign, uh, the there were reports yesterday that uh, Al Masr Al Yom, which is a private newspaper in Egypt, uh, some of its journalists have been have faced interrogation from the police because of publishing uh, a long, detailed report on police brutality in the country. What's your, have you seen that report? Uh, I'm not familiar with that report. I'm happy to look into it. Uh, again, we take press freedom very seriously, uh, but I just don't, I'm not familiar with the, the particulars of that one. Yeah. Yes, Can go ahead. stay in Egypt? Uh, yeah, stay in Egypt, yes, yeah, go ahead, yeah. Michelle. Uh, um, the um, uh, Egyptian foreign ministry spokesperson has said that uh, uh, Minister uh, Shukri and uh, Secretary Kerry will discuss uh, this afternoon the resume or, or resuming the uh, strategic dialogue between the two countries. Do you expect this to happen soon? Well, I'm not going to get ahead of the uh, of the Secretary's meeting with Foreign Minister Shukri. Um, there will be a, sp uh, a spray at the top, and uh, I think we'll put out a readout of the meeting after after it's over. I think we may also have a fact sheet uh, on on one aspect uh, of the talks, which we'll put out a little bit later today. But I'll let. Uh, I'll let the secretary and Minister Shukri meet first before we put that out. Press freedom. Are you, yes. are you going to be addressing at all over the next week uh, what happened in Paris to Charlie Hebdo or any other similar uh, acts against media regarding publishing of blasphemous uh, material deemed blasphemous by some? Uh, well, I, I don't have the full lineup of, of each case that we will um, highlight in the in the course of the week, but I... I, uh, I Given the, that it was just about the most deadly attack on the press Certainly. in recent memory, um, would it, what would it, I mean, can you really avoid it in a week on, on press freedom? I, I understand. I understand the question. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have the, the full the full lineup for the week. We'll uh, we'll, we'll keep you in rapt attention for the remainder of the week. <laughs> and then on uh, Iran... Um, yes. Can you, can you uh, give a hint at all at what uh, uh, Secretary Kerry and Minister Zarif will be discussing? I think Energy Secretary Moniz described sanctions as one particular uh, issue that remains unresolved at this point. Will that, will that be at the head of the agenda, or will that include other things? Well, the Secretary has a pretty packed schedule today, so we don't expect this meeting to be a, a, an extremely lengthy one. Um, it'll, it will certainly, and there's a lot to discuss on the nuclear issue. I'm not going to break it down into component elements, um, but we certainly uh, expect it to be focused on the nuclear issue, um, as as we always do. I think it's uh, I think it's also quite likely that the secretary will raise the fate of American citizens uh, who remain uh, in Iran, either in prison or missing, and uh, so uh, we'll we'll be doing a readout then after uh, after. The so I mean, if it's not going to be a very lengthy issue, is the goal then essentially to to what to uh, keep the relationship and the lines of communication open to to smooth over some of the tensions that emerged after the framework agreement? Well, what, we've got, we've got, an, we've got uh, a lot of work to do between now and the end of June. Of course, Under Secretary Sherman was in Vienna uh, last week, and so this is an opportunity to, uh, to continue the, the high-level momentum uh, behind uh, reaching uh, conclusion, a, a joint comprehensive uh, plan of action by the end of June. But it sounds like from this uh, meeting, you don't expect uh, it's not supposed to be a deeply substantive meeting as much as kind of a, a, a benchmark in the process. Well, it's it's not going to be like the Lausanne uh, talks where we had uh, perhaps, uh, you, know, you know, days and days uh, of, of detailed negotiations, but it's certainly, you know, going to be focused on, on all the same, uh, on all the same issues, even if they're not going to get into as much detail just given the, the limited time. Um, uh, yes? Uh, well, if time allows, they may discuss it. But again, this is this is not going to be an extremely long uh, meeting. Um, if it does come up, uh, you know, I think it's uh, likely the secretary would say what we've been saying publicly that uh, that all parties should conduct themselves in a manner consistent with UN Security Council resolutions and applicable uh, international law. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay, <clears throat> two topics. Uh, what do you think about uh, Iran, uh, Iranian participation in the Geneva uh, talks, like the Syrian opposition talks in Geneva? So, with respect uh, with respect to the um, uh, the UN um, special envoy, um, you know, there there of course has been discussion um, about uh, convening. Uh, 
meetings. Uh, I think it's important to point out that Special Envoy de Mistura uh, emphasized that these are not negotiations. This is not Geneva III. Uh, the U.S. Special Envoy uh, for Syria, Daniel Rubinstein, uh, will, uh, will be part of the upcoming UN-led consultations in Geneva. Um, but again, we don't see these as negotiations. These are consultations. I think that's the way uh, that the, the, uh, the Special Envoy has described them. Uh, uh, but but how do you look into the Iranian participation into in that? Well, we're we're aware of, of reports that Iran uh, has been invited. Uh, we we would refer you to Demistura's uh, uh, just and he, him and his team for more information. Uh, if Iran wants to play a constructive role in, in peacefully ending uh, the Syrian conflict, uh, we think the way forward is clear. End its support uh, for the Assad regime and endorse the principles of the Geneva uh, Communique. We don't mind the participation of Iranian. Uh, Again, that's you know the the scope, the dates, the participation are things that the UN Special Envoy is working on, um, and you know the, but the principle is clear: the Geneva Communique. But, but Do you don't mind like sitting with the Iranians on the same table to consult? Well, again, let's 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 see what uh, what what details we get from the Special Envoy. About Can I ask an, uh, another topic, please? No, uh, no, no, stay on Syria. Let's, second, let's stay on okay. Syria, then we'll come back. Uh, Roz, and then we'll go yeah. to Michelle. Uh, do you have anything about uh, reports that the Syrian military may have used chlorine <laughs> against uh, citizens? in uh, both uh, Idlib and Hama on Sunday? Have you heard anything about this? Well, we're, we're seeking more information about, uh, about those uh, allegations. We are not in a position to confirm those details. I think the United States' uh, view uh, on the Assad regime's uh, use of chlorine uh, as a weapon has been quite clear. It's been stated by the White House, by Secretary Kerry, by Ambassador Power. Um, but I don't have the, I, I'm not able to confirm uh, those specific allegations. If there were confirmation, would this heighten the U.S.'s uh, push to do something about the Syrian military's behavior in light of the testimony that was offered two weeks ago at the U.N. Security Council? Well, if these, if these allegations do turn out to be true, it would just be the latest tragic example of the Assad regime's atrocities in Syria. Um, you know, they continue to flout international standards and norms, um, including the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, so uh, I don't have uh, any steps to announce at this point, but um, you know clearly it would be consistent with a pattern of uh, uh, of, of truly um, you know uh, grave um, uh, use of, of chlorine as a, as a weapon um, by the Assad regime. Are the uh, international community's hands tied because chlorine is not classified as a weapon per se? No, it doesn't, uh, doesn't tie the uh, international community's hands. Uh, of course, chlorine is a, is a chemical that can be used for industrial and other purposes in addition uh, to being used as a weapon, but that doesn't change the Chemical Weapons Convention's um, uh, view and, uh, on, on its use as a weapon. Michelle? Did you Thanks. mean there will be consequences? Well, uh, look, we, we stand by our uh, previous uh, statements that the, that the Assad regime has in the past used chlorine uh, as a chemical weapon. The OPCW uh, has, has reported on this um, extensively. Um, uh, I, I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, specific steps to announce now. We're looking into these newest allegations. Now, Syria hasn't faced any consequences from the U.S. for chlorine gas use. Is that right? Well, uh, I think there has, you know, if, if, you mean, if you mean a military uh, uh, step, then yes, uh, you're, you're right. Um, but I think the response, the international response to the Assad regime's continued uh, use uh, not only of chlorine as a weapon, uh, but its attacks on the Syrian people, uh, which have led to countless deaths um, and dislocations, um, have the attention of the international community. That's why we're working uh, with the uh, Syrian opposition uh, and, uh, and other forces within Syria. Even non militarily, uh, how what would have been the consequences, <coughs> direct consequences to well, the Assad Syria regime? Syria is, for... is largely isolated internationally. But they were time. anyway. I mean, they've mm -hmm. used even worse chemicals. Uh, and Which led to a, a, a situation in which the international community pressed uh, Syria, right. uh, and, Syria and, and we've gotten out 100 percent of but, their declared can you point more to, serious chemical weapons as can well. Can you point to any specific consequences the Syrian government has faced for chlorine gas use? Again, we're we're looking into this, and we're working with our partners. I don't have anything more. Uh, why, that, so. why why should they heed your call to stop using these, your mm -hmm. and other and the and the call of other governments if they haven't been punished for it? Again, we continue to work with our international partners. I don't have anything more to add uh, on that. Um, Jen, yeah, Michelle. Uh, you said that, that uh, Ambassador Rubenstein will uh, participate in the consultation yes. that. Uh, 
special envoy de Mistura will make. Uh, is he ready to meet with the Syrian regime delegation? Uh, Again, we don't know what the format uh, or, or the, uh, you know, again, these are consultations, these are not negotiations, so we'll wait to see what the, um, what the actual, um, you know, details are uh, of the consultations that uh, the Special Envoy is announcing, and then we'll be able to tell you more about exactly how the U.S. will engage there. The point mm -hmm. is that he will be our, our senior official who will, uh, who will take part, but whom he'll meet with. Uh, and uh, is is all something that will develop in response to the a more specific agenda. Um, in from principle, the is there any thinking about uh, meeting the regime? Uh, again, uh, we don't. We I, I don't have any plans to announce about that. We'll uh, we'll see how this uh, how these consultations uh, take shape. Yeah, go ahead, Brad. On Syria. Yeah. Um, there was a uh, one report. Um, I believe it was the Washington Post that suggested uh, Assad's government is far weaker than. Uh, many imagined that perhaps it crumbles before our eyes uh, in the coming months or whenever. Uh, is, that, is that your uh, assessment in this building, that the Assad regime is crumbling or is uh, in deep trouble right now? I don't have an analysis of the internal dynamics of the Syrian government to offer. Clearly, Assad has lost his legitimacy. We've said that uh, a number of times. Uh, but I don't have, uh, you know, I, I don't have a uh, an analysis of uh, of their uh, of the regime's longevity. It's clear they've outlived the uh, the welcome of its own, their own people, uh, which I think is the important thing. But um, uh, on those details, uh, I don't see the know. tide of the conflict fundamentally uh, shifting at this at this stage. Uh, well, I, again, the, you know, the battlefield analysis from here is uh, is something we uh, we do not try uh, to engage in. Um, you know, and. Um, so okay. I, I don't have uh, okay. uh, that. I don't have a prediction to make of that, of that sort. Too. Yeah. Uh, Any reaction to the death of the intelligence uh, official uh, Rustum Ghazali? I don't have any response uh, to that. Uh, additional on Syria or? Uh, um, uh, okay, um, yeah, we'll, we'll go to Pam and then we'll come here. Do you have any reaction to today's re-election in Sudan of President Bashir, especially considering he is still wanted by the ICC for war crimes? We have said, uh, uh, and we'll, I'll repeat, we regret uh, the government of Sudan's failure to create a free, fair, and conducive elections environment. Uh, the restrictions on political rights and freedoms, the lack of a credible national dialogue, and the continuation of armed conflict in Sudan's periphery um, are among the reasons for the reported low participation and the very low voter uh, turnout. Um, so, as a result of this, we do not consider the outcome of these elections to be a credible expression of the will uh, of the Sudanese people. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, uh, it's uh, about Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. um, uh, really, words cannot express uh, how sudden the Ethiopian uh, people are right now. Uh, as you heard the news, um, ISIS shot and uh, beheaded uh, 29 Ethiopians and one Muslim who stood up in, su in support of his um, Ethiopian uh, Christian brothers. And uh, there is no doubt that ISIS will continue to behead Christians unless the world leaders uh, take decisive action to stop or destroy ISIS. And my question is, besides condemning and besides um, bombing ISIS targets, what is the United States current effort to stop or uh, to destroy ISIS effectively from beheading more people? Uh, well, we've got a uh, you know, we've got a broad uh, campaign uh, against against ISIL, and uh, it covers uh, multiple pillars, including uh, our military actions uh, in in Iraq and Syria, our support to the Iraqi security forces, our work with Syrian opposition, as well as our partnership with countries in the region uh, to to fight uh, ISIL, uh, both in security terms, uh, also in terms of delegitimizing uh, their their message. Uh, and so we've got a broad campaign. Uh, of course, uh, with uh, with respect to Ethiopia, we've uh, we've had uh, just recently uh, high-level uh, talks between Under Secretary Sherman and her counterparts in Addis Ababa. Uh, so this is a, uh, a a threat that we take seriously and that we work closely with our our partners uh, on. Leslie, yes, you had a yeah, you had a follow-up. Um, I, I was going to ask you also for a reaction to the outcome of the uh, the uh, elections in Cyprus. Yes. A lot of elections uh, this uh, the last few days. Um, <clears throat> so, 
we congratulate uh, Mustafa Akinja on his election as the leader of the Turkish Cypriot community. And we, we uh, continue to support the negotiation process uh, conducted under the auspices of the United Nations and Special Negotiator Ida and to reunify the island as a bi-zonal and bi-communal federation. And we reiterate our willingness to assist uh, in any way that the parties uh, would find useful. Do you know if, uh, if the secretary has spoken to him? No, no, no yeah. calls uh, to, to read Because uh, the secretary that. did say last week he was interested in trying to move forward on the peace process and suggested a bigger role for the U.S. Um, in that. Uh, well, uh, our commitment uh, to uh, you know to the peace process uh, is is longstanding, and uh, the secretary, of course, had a couple of opportunities to talk about that when he met with the foreign ministers of Greece and of Turkey, um, and uh, you know, we look forward to working uh, with uh, with Mustafa uh, Akinja in his capacity as the leader of the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. Um, uh, yeah, we'll 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 go uh, along this side and then come back. So start all the way in the back. Yeah. Uh, one, just behind you, then we'll come forward. Yeah. Okay. So in Iraq, uh, do you, there are reforms in the Iraqi uh, uh, armed forces uh, happened in the past and still happening, and also in the Peshmerga divisions. Do you, uh, is the United States uh, behind these reforms or endorsing these reforms uh, in any way? Uh, because one of the Iraqi lawmakers. Uh, accused the United States of appointing or forcing Iraqi government to appoint one of the Sunni leaders for the Muslim operations. And that's one. The other one is on the U.S. veterans joined uh, Peshmerga in Iraq. What is the status for them when they come back or when they injured or killed for their family and also for themselves? Well, the first question, uh, I, I'm not aware of those reports to which you're referring, so I don't have any comment uh, on on those specifics. Of course, we have joint operations centers uh, in, in the Kurdish region as well as in, uh, in Baghdad, and we work closely with our uh, Iraqi counterparts as they, as they look at uh, the, how they want to carry forward the fight against ISIL. Uh, but uh, I don't have any, uh, any comment on those, and, and certainly decisions about how Iraq's forces will respond, uh, whether it's in Mosul or anywhere else, are decisions made by Iraq's leaders, not by the United States. And there was a, there was a, a, a response by the uh, uh, U.S. ambassador to Baghdad, uh, Stuart Jones, about this, and and I was uh, wondering if you have any other more than that that he had that he said that the, the appointing commander of the Mosul operations was not a U.S. initiative. Well, uh, I think that's exactly that's exactly right. Um, okay. And so I don't have anything. The second uh, question to, to add uh, to it. The second question. Uh, some, you know, voluntarily, some U.S. veterans oh, joined. Oh, well, uh, we, uh, we have long uh, advised American citizens against travel to Iraq. No American citizens who, uh, who might possibly be uh, there in any kind of capacity fighting are doing so with uh, approval uh, or any sort of support of the United States government, uh, so I don't have any, any comment. Uh, Will on, be on any the, issue when they come back to the U.S.? Uh, I, I don't have any uh, specific comment on, on that. No, uh, 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 well... Well, again, I don't have any any comment uh, on that. Yes. Wait, no, no, no. Just oh. just to follow this up. Just okay. Sorry. I mean, yeah, Brad, go ahead. He, he raised a good point. Is is it is this a criminal offense fighting for the Peshmerga? Well, that would be a Department of Justice uh, question. What are um, you advising American citizens? Well, we're about? we're advising American citizens against to travel to Iraq. Um, okay, uh, that, but that, that applies uh, across the board. But so. you're not putting out any specific warning, this government about taking a weapon and joining a, a non-state military group and fighting. Mm -hmm. Well, again, that's military. Well, that's, I think, is a separate, uh, would be a separate question, but yeah. uh, that, that would be a Department of Justice question. I'm happy to check with them and see if they have uh, guidance uh, that they're Do, are you a, aware, able to offer. Um, are you aware of whether uh, Homeland Security officials would uh, be uh, taking a closer look at Americans who I, say they're I'd coming back to ask, Iraq? I'd encourage you to ask DHS colleagues about that. Yes, go ahead. When the chairman is going to Dhaka, Bangladesh, to have a fourth annual U.S.-Bangladesh partnership dialogue, do you have any agenda, updated agenda what they're going to talk about? And also, the um, um, second question is, is Nisha Deshai Bishwal is going uh, along with Under Secretary Sherman? To Dhaka, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's on Thursday they're going. Yeah, I, I don't I don't have uh, I don't have travel details to announce. I'm happy to look into that and uh, and see see if we can uh, if we have anything more. We're happy to share that. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, 
there was there were reports that President Barzani of the Kurdistan region is coming to Washington in the first week of May, and the uh, uh, State Department confirmed the visit that he's coming here. Do you have anything new about that visit? And I don't have any announcement to make about uh, about. Has he uh, been invited by the State Department? Has confirmed that he's coming to Washington in the f next coming weeks, but. Uh, has he been invited by this building? I don't have any details to announce about uh, about his uh, about his possible travel. Uh, yes, go ahead. Can you address reports alleging a secret easing of rules for the drone program in Pakistan? Uh, I think those reports refer to uh, purported uh, decisions made in the White House, so I would refer you to White House colleagues uh, and then, on that. Secondly, um, do you have any reaction to the comments by former President George W. Bush criticizing a uh, um, foreign policy saying uh, President Obama is putting U.S. in retreat? Well, if, if I remember, if I, if I understood correctly, I think that was a closed event, and I haven't seen a transcript of, uh, of his comments. I think people have been reporting um, based on what they, what they heard. Uh, I'm not going to uh, respond, uh, respond to those. Um, yes, yes I, I was just wondering if you have uh, a leader for uh, Secretary Scary uh, travel to Ethiopia and Djibouti meeting their presidents. Uh, I don't have a travel announcement to make. I think we'll be have one. Uh, we'll have one soon, but it's uh, we don't have a travel announcement to, to make today. Okay. Um, uh, Jeff, all right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Brad. Did you have? Okay, you know? Laura. I'm actually hoping we could go back to Nepal real briefly. Sure. Um, a couple of questions. First, do you have any estimate on how many Americans were registered as as living or visiting Nepal at the time of the earthquake? Mm -hmm. um, I don't have I don't have an estimate to, to to give. Again, as I think we've talked about in other contexts, we have a lot of people who who register, um, who may be there temporarily, who may stay longer. It's it's hard uh, because there's no requirement to register. It's hard to come up with um, a uh, a precise uh, estimate of uh, of the the American presence uh, in in Nepal. Right, and then um, was there any actual damage to the infrastructure of the embassy itself? Uh, our embassy is is open and operating. Uh, I'm not aware of any uh, of any significant damage, at least not that is impeding their operations. Uh, I think, of course, we're you know we're looking into into that as uh, as part of the uh, response uh, to the earthquake. Uh, but of course, there are lots of other lots of other work to be done, um, taking care of the American citizens who are there, as well as liaising with the, the government colleagues. Um, so we're able to continue operating, and in the coming days, we may. Um, you know, have an opportunity to uh, uh, to share more about whether there was any damage to our facility. Um, and then all embassy personnel as well are accounted for and uninjured. Um, so all of the American uh, personnel at the embassy are accounted for. We are continuing our efforts to account for all of our local uh, employees. Um, so we we are still trying to verify um, all of the local employees. Uh, They're not all accounted for. We have not we have not uh, finished accounting for all of our local um, staff um, at at the embassy. Uh, all American staff, those who are under the authority of the chief of mission, we have accounted for. Okay, thanks everybody.